Today, we're going to be talking about dementia other than Alzheimer's disease. The objectives for this talk include, first of all, to explain types of dementia uh, that are included under this broad category referred to as frontotemporal dementia. Then we want to distinguish uh, frontotemporal dementias from other common types of intellectual loss, such as Alzheimer's disease. We want to talk about the frequency and severity of alcoholism in the elderly, because drinking uh, produces cognitive loss, and distinguish alcohol-induced dementia from other common types of dementia. Next, we want to talk about the natural history of prion-mediated disorders, such as Creutzfeldt disease. Uh, and finally, we want to talk about the frequency and presenting symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Although this is an uncommon cause of intellectual loss, it's frequently talked about in the literature. Let's begin by talking about the types of dementia under the uh, heading of frontotemporal uh, dementia. Actually, the broad category uh, that's included under this uh, disease is what's referred to as frontal, frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Frontotemporal lobar degeneration is broken into three uh, categories of diseases. Frontotemporal dementia, semantic amnesia, and progressive non-fluent aphasia. The last two are very uncommon disorders that have very, very specific types of clinical setting. However, the frontotemporal dementia is more common, and it can be uh, broken down into Pick's disease, frontal lobe uh, dementia or degeneration, and several other different types of disease headings. So consequently, you start off with this big umbrella term referred to as frontotemporal lobar degeneration, and it then divides into multiple other types of diseases. Frontal temporal lobar degeneration, again, can be broken into frontotemporal degeneration, uh, or sometimes referred to as FTD, progressive non-fluent aphasia, and semantic amnesia. The latter two require a neuropsychologist with specific testing to distinguish them from other types of intellectual loss, such as Alzheimer's disease or uh, st stroke-related uh, intellectual loss. It turns out that if you look at the brains of people with progressive uh, non-fluent aphasia and semantic amnesia, although they have both frontal and temporal lobe atrophy, the actual microscopic appearance that you see in their brain uh, is pretty much undefined. That's in, distinct, in, in distinction to diseases such as Alzheimer's disease where there's plaques and tangles. Actually, we know so little about these two diseases that literally at this point we're not completely sure what the microscopic appearance is. However, with the frontotemporal degenerations, we know that in addition to having uh, symmetrical loss of either the frontal lobes or the temporal lobes, they have specific neuropathologies. If we're going to talk about frontotemporal uh, de dementias, it's important to review the function of the frontal and the temporal lobes. Remember, the frontal lobes are involved with things like speech, mood, social graces, and initiative. These are very high-order intellectual functions, as opposed to the temporal lobes, which are involved with things like understanding, uh, speech perception, that sort of thing. If we look at the frontal lobe degenerations, we see that if the frontal lobes are damaged, if we use the computer model, for instance, for understanding how the brain works, the frontal lobes function almost as the server in your system. That's where executive function uh, is programmed. The frontal lobes function as a clipboard in which they hold on to groups of, uh, of information that must be remembered in order to complete a specific task. So, for instance, if I'm getting up in the morning and I need to go to work, I have to remember what I'm doing. I have to remember where my clothing is. I need to remember uh, how to take a shower. Uh, and I need to have this all done in a sequence to get myself from bed to work in the morning. That type of grouped knowledge, that sort of grouped memory, is sometimes organized in the frontal lobes. The initiative that gets me up in the morning and tells me it time, it's time to go 
is also uh, uh, localized in the frontal lobes, and that's referred to a, in part as executive function. When we start talking about things like frontal lobe degeneration, those frontal lobes are damaged, as opposed to uh, temporal lobe function, which is things like memory and language, or parietal lobe function, which is things like motor skills. If you want to think of the brain as a computer, then, your uh, workstation is located in your temporal lobes, your heart disk is located in your parietal lobes, as well as in your occipital lobes, and the brain stem is the place that contains the systems programs that tells the whole computer how fast to run. What happens in frontal lobe uh, dementias is that the workstation and the hard disk are still operating properly, but the server that sort of keeps the, the system running has been damaged by the disease. Frontal lobe uh, and frontal temporal degeneration can be broken down into several disease uh, entities. Uh, frontal temporal degeneration can include frontal lobe degeneration of the non-Alzheimer's type, sometimes referred to as FLD, and Pick's disease. It's important to remember that in any of the frontotemporal dementias, the major presenting symptoms are personality disorder and social conduct disorder. In other words, there's, there's a change in the personality and there is a change in their social abilities. Why is that? Well, here's a brain of a patient with frontotemporal uh, degeneration. What you see is that uh, the frontal lobes, which are in the upper part of your screen, are diminished in size as opposed to the more posterior aspect, the parietal and the occipital lobes, which are in the lower half of your screen. If we look at this brain from the side, as we see in this next slide, what we see is that the sulcus, the space between the gyrus, is widened in the frontal lobes. If we look at this from the me medial side, from the midline, we see again that the sulci are widened and the gyri are reduced. This is specific frontal lobe atrophy. And this patient had one of the frontal temporal dementias. This patient would have had all alterations in their motivation and their social functions. So, for instance, the patient would have demonstrated inertia. It would have been hard for them to get going. They wouldn't have wanted to do many of the basic things that they would have done spontaneously. They demonstrate social disinhibition. What that means is that the patient may say or do things that they never would have said or done before, make sexually inappropriate comments, uh, demonstrate sexually inappropriate behavior. All of these functions of self-control and initiative are programmed through the frontal lobe. When that part of the brain is damaged, then you begin to show uh, symptoms such as disinhibition. They become distractible because your frontal lobes help keep you on task. On the other hand, since the uh, frontal lobes are specifically damaged, but the memory circuits, which are located in the temporal lobe, are left intact, you would have preserved memory. You would have preserved spatial function. That's programmed in the parietal lobes. This goes back to the first graphic that we demonstrated of the brain earlier on, demonstrating that different brain regions do different things. So when you get one of these frontal lobe dementias or one of these frontotemporal degenerations, you're going to lose functions predominantly in the frontal lobe. When we start talking about the nomenclature for primary frontal lobe dementia, there are many different names that you will find in your reading or in the literature. There is dementia of the frontal lobe type. There is frontal lobe dementia. There is frontal lobe degeneration. There's frontal lobe degeneration of the non-Alzheimer's tape in this dementia lacking distinctive histopathology. All of these terms mean the same thing, that either your frontal lobes or your frontal and temporal lobes are dying for reasons that are not completely clear to us. What happens with frontal lobe damage uh, is that the inattention that is, that is produced by this disease is caused by disturbance of working memory. Remember I was saying how your frontal lobes act as a clipboard? They hold on to multiple pieces of memory-bound information that have to be used in sequence, like, for instance, getting up, taking your shower, and going to work. Well, when you lose 
uh, those frontal lobes, then you lose the ability to hold on to those, that sequenced memory. In other words, the, you lose your executive files. So patients with frontal lobe damage will demonstrate memory type problems, but it's different from Alzheimer's disease where you tell the person a specific piece of information and then a couple minutes later they can't seem to recall that specific information. The memory problems in frontal lobe degen degeneration or frontal lobe dementia are more difficult to identify than the ones in Alzheimer's disease because the Alzheimer patients have a specific damage to short-term memory circuits as opposed to the frontal lobe dementia which has damage to circuits that are more diffuse and more difficult to pinpoint. Another type of disease that can cause specific atrophy of either the frontal lobes or the temporal lobes is what's referred to as PICS disease. PICS is, has the old term of lobar atrophy it's an old disease. It was described by Dr. Pick in 1892 in a woman with pre-senile dementia and dysphagia. Her dysphagia uh, was produced by damage primarily to her temporal lobe. Pick body, which is the characteristic microscopic finding, was first described by actually Alzheimer's in 1911. Let's look at the type of atrophy that you see in Pick's disease. In this picture, we're looking at the top or the superior surface of the brain. And to the left, you can see that the frontal lobes have a walnut appearance. That is specific lobar atrophy. But that atrophy stops right at the motor strip. And none of the parietal lobe is damaged. So for instance, going back to our computer model, the hard disk, which is located in your parietal lobe, would remain relatively intact in this patient. However, the frontal lobes, where executive function in your clipboard is located, that would be severely damaged in this disease. So this patient would still be able to dress themselves and do many complex motor skills. On the other hand, they would be disinhibited, they would be slovenly, they would be uh, hard to get to do basic things, even though they would have the motor skills to do them, like get up, get dressed, and take their bath. Here's a close-up view of that atrophy, and look at the stark difference on the left of the atrophic brain versus the normal brain to the right. This is lobar atrophy, typical of Pick's disease. Here we see a case, on the left is the normal, and on the right is a Pick brain, and you can see that the parietal lobe above is relatively intact, but the temporal lobe is severely atrophic. This patient would have severe language problems, primarily receptive aphasia. And this is a different pattern of atrophy also seen in Pick's disease. What is the characteristic finding that you see in Pick's disease that distinguishes it from other disorders? It's the Pick body. Here we see the arrow pointing to these circular dense inclusions which are inside individual neurons located in the hippocampus. These are PICC bodies and they are characteristic of PICS disease. Most of the frontal lobe degenerations do not have PICS disease. They simply have loss of neurons. If you see PICC bodies, that's typical of PICS disease. Now let's contrast frontotemporal dementia and frontotemporal degeneration to Alzheimer's disease. First of all, patients with frontal lobe or frontotemporal dementia tend to have an earlier onset and pre predominantly non-cognitive behavioral changes. Remember we were talking in the Alzheimer's segment how Alzheimer patients get first they get memory loss and then they have language problems and then it progresses to behavior problems. Typically, the frontotemporal dementias have behavior problems first and then they develop discrete intellectual losses. So for instance, the patient may uh, quit work because they don't want to go. They may quit bathing because they don't see the importance to it. They may say things that are inappropriate, yet they look intellectually intact. As the years progress, however, then they develop memory problems and other intellectual loss. These types of dementias can sometimes be distinguished on, uh, on brain imaging such as spec scanning. The typical spec scan of an Alzheimer patient demonstrates diminished flow in the parietal region. The typical spec scan on a frontal lobe dementia would, of course, demonstrate diminished flow in the frontal lobes. So there are ways to distinguish frontotemporal dementia from Alzheimer's disease. Likewise, Alzheimer patients tend to not get apathy 
and disinhibition until later in their disease when they also develop frontal lobe in, uh, injury. It's relatively uncommon to see an Alzheimer patient with severe behavioral symptoms as their first uh, presenting sign. And finally, frontotemporal dementias are syndromes in search of a pathology. There really is no specific brain pathology for the frontotemporal dementias like we have for diffuse Lewy body disease, Alzheimer's disease, or vascular dementia. This is a collection of diseases which specifically kill either the frontal lobes, the temporal lobes, or both the frontal and temporal lobes together. Some of them, interestingly enough, may have a genetic component, perhaps linked to chromosome 17. We also know that the underlying molecular biology associated with these disorders is probably different from that of Alzheimer's disease. Remember in the Alzheimer's segment we talked about how amyloid probably plays a major role in Alzheimer's? Well, amyloid doesn't play much of a role in frontotemporal dementias. Probably the molecular component of the cytoskeleton that we have referred to as tau probably plays a major role in the pathogenesis of the frontotemporal dementias. So we see there's a stark difference between Alzheimer's and frontotemporal dementias. Alzheimer's disease, primarily amyloid. Frontotemporal dementias, primarily tau. Alzheimer's disease, later onset, more memory problems as first symptoms. Frontotemporal dementias, earlier onset. Disinhibition and other behavioral problems as presenting symptoms. Two significantly different diseases uh, with probably different biologies. Now that we've talked about the frontotemporal dementias, let's move on to another common type of intellectual loss in the elderly, and that is alcohol-induced dementia. This is the one that doesn't get much play uh, in, in, in either the medical profession or in the, in the lay media. However, it is a very, very important cause of intellectual loss in elders, and also in patients with other types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's or vascular dementia, continued alcohol use will worsen the dementia. First of all, is drinking a problem in, el in the elderly? And the answer is yes. The majority, in some es estimates as high as 60% of elders drink. That's not to say that 60% of elders are problem drinkers, but most elders probably drink uh, into latter life. If you look at use and abuse based on different studies, you see different numbers. So for instance, uh, in this compilation of several different studies, anywhere between one-third and uh, two-thirds of, uh, of elders are abstinent from alcohol. However, 10 to 20 percent of elders are daily drinkers, and 7 to 8 percent are heavy drinkers, as defined to by a dozen to two dozen drinks per week. So consequently, daily drinking and heavy drinking is a common problem in the older patient. What about recognition of alcohol abuse? Is it easy to diagnose uh, alcohol-induced dementia? Well, the first thing about diagnosing alcohol-induced dementia is you have to identify that the patient is a drinker. How well does the medical profession do in identifying drinkers amongst our elders? Pretty poor. If you look at this study, as you see on the next graphic, 60% of drinkers and abusers are identified under the age of 60, but only 37% are recognized over the age of 60. In other words, doctors identify problem drinkers in two-thirds of younger folks, but only one-third of older folks, which means that two-third of older problem drinkers go unrecognized. That may be one of the reasons that alcohol-induced dementia is probably underdiagnosed. Alcohol is a big health problem as well as uh, a potential cause of dementia. We know that 10 to 15 percent of elders who present with any medical problem to an internist or primary care doctor have alcohol abuse as, or excessive use in their background. We also know that Medicare spends more money on alcohol-related hospitalizations in elders than it does on hospitalizations for coronary artery disease, for heart attack. So consequently, especially in the med medical setting, alcohol is a major problem that has to be dealt with. Why is alcohol a worse problem in the elders than it is in the younger folks when elders drink? 
Well, part of it has to do with uh, changes in alcohol metabolism. As we grow older, our percentage of body water is diminished. And remember, alcohol is distributed in water, so therefore there's le less body water for it to, to be diluted out in. The next thing is that our lean body mass is diminished, so therefore the impact of the alcohol is greater, which then produces a 20% increased peak blood level for alcohol uh, in an elder versus a younger patient. Older people get a bigger kick from alcohol than, than younger individuals do. How about screening for alcoholism? Can we look for uh, problem drinkers in our older patients? Absolutely. There are specific clinical screening instruments, such as the Michigan Alcoholism Screening Test, referred to as the MASC-G, or there's what's referred to as the CAGE, and I'm going to just talk about that in a second. The other thing is that routine laboratory studies can sometimes provide us with a tip-off. If, for instance, a patient has significantly megaloblastic indices, their mean corpuscular volume on their uh, CBC is elevated and there's no good explanation for it, then that may be a potential uh, flag for alcohol abuse. Likewise, in a patient, if you have unexplained elevated liver function studies, uh, you would want to be looking for alcohol abuse. However, remember, many problem drinkers have normal liver studies. So the best way to screen for alcoholism is not to be doing liver studies, but rather directly ask the patient. One simple, quick, direct way is what's referred to as the CAGE. Four easy questions that can be asked in 30 seconds in the outpatient setting. First, ask the patient, have you ever had to cut down on the amount that you drink? Secondly, has your family or friends ever been annoyed by your drinking or the consequences of your drinking? Third, have you ever felt guilty as a result of your drinking? And fourth, have you ever had to have an eye opener? In other words, drink in the morning to get yourself going. If you've got uh, over two of these as positive, then that's suggestive that you have a significant alcohol problem and it should be looked into uh, further. Consequently, you can see from this that this simple four-step question can help you screen patients to determine whether or not they may have a problem with drinking. What are some of the syndromes of cognitive loss associated with alcohol? Well, of course, there's alcohol-induced dementia, which may be the third, fourth, or fifth most common type of intellectual loss in elders. There's what's referred to as Wernicke's encephalopathy, Korsakoff's psychosis, and traumatic brain injury. Wernicke's encephalopathy is an acute onset confusional state brought on by thiamine deficiency in which the patient has abnormalities of eye movement and a delirium. This can be rapidly treated by injections of thiamine. It's completely reversible with injections of thiamine. When you see a patient with Wernicke's encephalopathy, it means that they have a serious drinking problem. They've been drinking so heavily that they become thiamine deficient. Korsakoff's psychosis is an amnesia. It's a memory problem associated with sustained long-term alcohol ingestion. There is no specific pathology to Korsakoff psychosis. And in fact, it's not really a psychosis at all. It's, a, it's an amnesia. They develop profound short-term memory loss. Their long-term memory is left pretty much intact, but they can't remember anything that happened 10 or 15 minutes ago. Traumatic brain injury we're going to talk about in just a second, but it's important to remember that alcoholics fall a lot, and when they fall, they hit their head and have traumatic brain injury. And as a result of that, then they have additional injury on top of that produced by their alcoholism. What are the parts of the brain that are consistently damaged by alcohol? Well, frontal lobes, cerebellum, and peripheral nerves. Let me briefly talk about peripheral nerve damage. What happens in alcoholics is that, that the nerves, especially the sensory nerves, to their arms, hands, legs, and feet uh, are damaged. So the patients develop what is called a stocking glove hypoesthesia. In other words, they don't feel their hands and don't feel their feet the way they used to. Sometimes it can progress to the point where it actually damages motor nerves as well as sensory nerves, and they become weak. But the important thing about this lack of sensation to their feet and their hands is that they can no longer tell where their feet are in three-dimensional space, which means, for instance, if they go out at night 
and can't see their feet as they walk, they tend to fall a lot, which then predisposes them to head injury. Keep that in mind when you're looking at your alcoholic patients. Likewise, there are other brain regions uh, uh, that are at risk uh, in uh, alcohol, uh, alcoholic patients. On the left, you see the frontal lobes from an alcoholic individual. On the right, you see the normal frontal lobes. Here you can see the very specific frontal lobe damage that occurs in alcoholism. As we talked about before in our frontotemporal dementias, when you have this type of injury, the patients become apathetic, they become disinhibited, they become uh, slovenly, they, and they can become hard to manage even though intellectually they seem intact. Uh, this in the setting of a patient who may be already somewhat impulsive, uh, that would, that's what predisposed them to drinking in the first place, uh, sets you up for a lot of behavioral problems in your alcoholic patients. And indeed, many alcoholic uh, dementia patients have a lot of behavioral consequences as a result of their brain injury. So the patient on the left had alcohol-induced dementia and he had predominantly frontal lobe symptoms as a result of this frontal lobe damage. On the left you see a normal uh, mammillary body and here the arrow points to this round-shaped mammillary body. On the right you see a shrunken, shriveled mammillary body in your alcoholic patient. Mammillary body damage is fairly common in Wernicke's encephalopathy. In the acute phase, it looks hemorrhagic, it looks beefy red, but in the chronic phase, it just simply looks atrophic. This patient had old Wernicke's encephalopathy that was successfully treated with thiamine. However, he had so much brain damage that he was demented even after they corrected his thiamine deficiency. Although you can see that the hippocampus on the left where the normal is not that much larger than the hippocampus on the right. Typically an Alzheimer patient, for instance, would have severe hippocampal injury, but this alcoholic patient did not. He instead had a lot of frontal lobe damage. And finally, cerebellar damage. Remember we were talking earlier about the fact that uh, the cerebellum is predisposed to injury from alcoholism? On the left you have what's called the anterior vermis from a normal cerebellum, and on the right you see the anterior vermis from an alcoholic. And you don't need to be a neuropathologist to see that the right is severely atrophic. What does your anterior vermis do? Well, it uh, controls truncal coordination. And if you've ever seen a sober alcoholic who has brain damage walk, they tend to weave and their trunk seems to be unsteady. That's because the cerebellum that controls that coordination is damaged by the alcoholism. So damage to their cerebellum produces uh, 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 produces abnormalities that predispose to falling and peripheral nerve damage also predisposes to falling. So consequently, alcoholics are at sub substantially increased risk for falling. This falling then produces blood clots on the brain referred to as subdural hematomas. And here we see a picture of a subdural clot. You can see just a little wisp of the dura at the top here, this white crescent margin of normal dura and then you see this big black blood clot and you can see that the marker underneath says subdural. That's the membrane that binds the blood clot up and you're looking at the marker through the membrane. This patient had a chronic subdural hematoma which acted as a space occupying mass in his brain. It slowly expanded. It was produced by trauma from falling and as a consequence of this expanding blood clot that you see here, in the next slide we see the aftermath in the brain on the right. On the left is a normal brain and on the right is the brain that had the subdural clot and you can see that the frontal lobe is displaced and compressed by this blood clot. This alcoholic patient had a chronic subdural hematoma which compressed his brain and ultimately produced his demise. So alcoholism not only poisons the brain, but it also poisons the peripheral nerves, and it produces complications such as head trauma that add additional damage to the brain. What's the treatment of alcohol-induced dementia? Well, first of all, it's abstinence. You're never too old to quit drinking. The second thing is that we know that patients with alcohol-induced dementia if they quit drinking, may actually regain a small amount of intellectual function. 
Patients with Alzheimer's disease tend to lose two to three points from their mini mental scores per year. If you take a patient with alcoholism and alcohol-induced dementia and make them abstinent, they will actually regain 0.2 to 0.3 points per year on their mini mental. So abstinence is a very, very important co component to the treatment of alcohol-induced dementia. Next, proper nutrition. Alcoholics tend to be nutritionally depleted. We just talked about the fact that thiamine can cause, uh, can cause brain injury. Uh, folic acid uh, is oftentimes de deficient. B12 is oftentimes deficient. And these vitamin deficiencies can produce intellectual loss. So proper nutrition and vitamin su supplementation are very important. And finally, you have to fix all of their medical problems. Remember, alcohol is a toxin for all organs. It damages your liver, it damages your heart, and these people need high quality medical care to maximize their medical function so that their brain function will be maximized. So that's alcohol-induced dementia. Alcohol-induced dementia is common in the elderly. It's oftentimes overlooked. It's a treatable and preventable cause of dementia, and it is a contributor in other types of dementia to intellectual loss. So, in, this, in these last two segments, in part nine and part 10 of the Dita Brain series, we've talked about vascular uh, dementia, diffuse Lewy body disease, frontotemporal dementia, and now alcohol-induced dementia. Those are the common types of intellectual loss in the elderly in addition to Alzheimer's disease. Now let's talk about some unusual kinds of dementia that get a lot of play in the press. The kinds of dementia that families always ask about even though we rarely see them in our everyday clinical practice. Let's begin by talking about prions. What are prions? Uh, and here we're talking about Creutzfeldt disease. Prions are infectious particles that are smaller than viruses. We can't see them with the electron microscope. They're very, very difficult to identify or to isolate. These types of infections really are only uh, transmitted by brain or other neural tissue. Uh, and they're not inactivated by standard disinfectants. If they're hard to catch, but they're almost impossible to kill once you have hot tissue like brain. Prion-mediated dementias are rare. For instance, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is less than one per million uh, in the United States. There's no demographic or geographical distinction. Uh, it, it just randomly occurs throughout our country. Any age can get it, but usually it's individuals over the age of 50. Almost all of it is spontaneous, 90%. 10% of it incorporates some genetic predisposition to getting these kinds of disorders. There are several actually, several actual types of prion-mediated uh, dementias. One is referred to as gerstmann strassler disease, uh, uh, and this is the familial variant of, uh, of uh, Creutzfeldt disease, but these are very, very rare. The most common type of prion-mediated dementia is Creutzfeldt disease. Again, it's important when we're talking about prions to remember that there is no documented transmission by blood, saliva, or other bodily secretions. So for instance, you can't get it through blood transfusions. It's not known to be transmitted. If you're taking care of a patient with uh, Creutzfeldt disease, or sometimes it's referred to as Jakob Creutzfeldt disease, or Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, uh, use standard universal precautions for body fluids and blood. Uh, those are recommended uh, despite the fact that there's no evidence that it can be transmitted. On the other hand, if you're dealing with anything from the brain, brain biopsies, spinal fluid, these are highly infectious and have to be treated very, very carefully uh, to prevent transmission. What are some known methods of prion transmission? Well, uh, Kuru, which is transmitted via cannibalism, uh, is, uh, is one way. Autopsy contamination, individuals such as myself who are neuropathologists have to take specific uh, precautions because we handle a lot of fresh brain tissues. 
Uh, neurosurgical instruments, if for instance they're doing a biopsy on a patient and it turns out that they have Creutzfeldt disease, uh, the neurosurgical instruments have to be sterilized in a very specific manner. Standard neurosurgical uh, uh, sterilization is not good enough to kill prions. And anything that has tissue in it from the brain or the ner nervous system can transmit one of these prions. So for instance, pituitary glands that are used for pituitary extracts have transmitted this disease. Corneas can contain the prions. And consequently, patients with uh, undiagnosed dementia should not be donors for corneas. Now, you can't talk about prion diseases without talking about mad cow disease. Mad cow disease is that uh, terrible veterinary disorder that occurred in England. It's referred to as bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Uh, and it is a, it is a prion-mediated uh, bovine infection. It sort of resembles scrapie, which occurs in sheep. Its links to humans is unknown, even though there was a big scare over eating uh, undercooked uh, hamburger in England, or even actually eating any British beef at all, uh, even though there was a big scare about that, the exact mechanism of transmission of mad cow disease uh, to humans is unclear, and it's not even clear at all that it can be transmitted. In fact, some scientists believe that it cannot pass from one species to another. Uh, what is the gross pathology that's typical of a patient with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which is the common prion-mediated disorder in humans. Well, first of all, you don't see much atrophy. It doesn't damage the hippocampus like Alzheimer's disease does. Uh, you'll see mild ventricular megaly, and there are no specific patterns of atrophy that you could expect to see on brain scan uh, or brain imaging that would tell you, hey, this is Creutzfeldt disease. If we look at a, the external appearance of a patient with Creutzfeldt, this was an autopsy which I performed. Uh, I'll tell you that this was actually missed by the clinician who was taking care of this patient. Uh, you see that the, uh, that the degree of atrophy is, is almost minimal. Here we see a coronal section through the middle portion of the brain, and again, very minimal atrophy. The ventricular system is minimally uh, dilated. Here we see a close-up of the hippocampi, bilaterally, and you can see that the hippocampus is not shrunken like you expect to see in Alzheimer's disease. What would I expect to see under the microscope uh, with Creutzfeldt disease? Well, the characteristic hallmark of Creutzfeldt is what's referred to as spongy form degeneration. Uh, in addition to that, you can see uh, loss of neurons and a glial reaction. What does this look like under the microscope? Big holes in the cortex. This is the picture of a microscopic image of brain tissue from a patient with Creutzfeldt disease and you see all of these holes. This is what's called spongy form degeneration. Characteristically, patients with Creutzfeldt disease or other forms of prion mediated disorder can be distinguished clinically from Alzheimer patients because they have a very rapid progression of their disease. 90% of patients with Creutzfeldt disease are dead within 18 months of onset of symptoms. Now there are other symptoms that people talk about, characteristic electroencephalographic pictures that may or may not be helpful. Uh, electroencephalogram, the EEG, is a brainwave test. Some people talk about myoclonic epilepsy, or I should say myoclonic jerks, where their arms and their uh, begin to jerk. Uh, that can be seen in Creutzfeldt, but it can also be seen in other types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease. The distinguishing clinical feature for a patient with Creutzfeldt is the rapid clinical progression. If you have a patient who was perfectly normal six months ago, and now all of a sudden they're severely demented, and there's no clear explanation for their dementia, they didn't have a bad head injury, they haven't had a huge stroke, they've just become demented, you must consider Creutzfeldt in that individual. There are no known treatments for Creutzfeldt disease. Uh, antiviral, antifungal, antibacterials do not work on this infectious uh, protein particle. And again, 90% of these individuals are dead within 18 months after the onset of the disease. That's Creutzfeldt disease then. It's a rare disorder. People are worried about it and sometimes fearful of it. 
but the fact of the matter is it's very, very uncommon to find Creutzfeldt. Not only that, patients tend to die in under two years. Finally, let's talk about normal pressure hydrocephalus. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is one of these disorders, uh, as we say in the Bible, many are called but few are chosen. It gets called frequently on the clinical basis, but when you actually look at the brain at the time of death, usually uh, patients who are said to have normal pressure hydrocephalus actually have something else, like Alzheimer's disease. Overall, the incidence of NPH, as it's referred to, are rare. The pathology is, occurs from either unifocal or multifocal slowing of CSF flow uh, or uh, scarring of the arachnoidal granulations. That, that is the spaces that absorb the spinal fluid uh, out of uh, the cavity of the brain after it has been produced inside the ventricles. There are two kinds of hydrocephalus that you see in, in older individuals. There is what's referred to as obstructive, and then there's referred to what is referred to as exvacuole. Obstructive, or what's sometimes referred to as non-communicating hydrocephalus, is due to the obstruction of flow of cerebral spinal fluid. Remember, CSF, or cerebral spinal fluid, this clear liquid, is made on the inside of the brain. It flows out through the ventricle systems, and then up and over the surfaces of the brain, and into the sinuses that are located in the dura, and it gets pulled back into the blood system. It, it is weeped in the, out of the ventricles uh, from blood vessels, and it's absorbed in the dura back up by blood vessels. If the point of absorption in the dura is scarred or closed, then you will have obstruction. That may be one of the causes of NPH. On the other hand, many older people have enlarged ventricles, and in reality, this is hydrocephalus ex vacuo, or communicating hydrocephalus. What's happened is that the brain tissue has died, and the brain uh, expands out, and as it expands out, the fluid cavity becomes uh, greater, uh, so the ventricles enlarge to take up for the space that's lost by uh, the dying brain tissue. This is referred to as hydrocephalus ex vacuo. Many Alzheimer patients who have lost considerable amounts of brain tissue have enlarged ventricles, and this is due to the tissue loss. What do we see in a patient who has normal pressure hydrocephalus? What you see is very large ventricles, but all of the holes, the, all of the foramen are open. The foramen of uh, Monroe, the cerebral aqueduct, the foramen of Lushkin mengendi they are all patent. Sometimes, though, what you'll see is that the outer coverings of the brain, uh, referred to as the leptomeninges, may be thickened, indicating that the patient may have had an infection or a small amount of blood uh, somewhere in the past, and it's caused scar. This is a picture of a brain with normal pressure hydrocephalus. Here you see the owl's eye-shaped ventricles that are markedly dilated. The third ventricle here, as depicted by the arrow, is also dilated. And the inferior horns of the vent lateral ventricle, depicted here, are dilated as well. The entire ventricular system is dilated in this patient. Under the microscope, this patient did not show evidence of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and as it, when the, each of the foramen was examined, uh, the foramen of Monroe, the cerebral aqueduct, etc., they were shown to be patent. So there was no evidence of obstruction and no evidence of other diseases which would explain this patient's hydrocephalus. This, can, this was referred to as normal pressure hydrocephalus. Under the microscope, you don't see anything in NPH. There is no real pathology. Uh, sometimes, though, you will find other types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's and diffuse Lewy body disease. When you find another type of uh, cause for the dementia, then it is thought that that is what caused the enlarged ventricles and not normal pressure hydrocephalus. Sometimes you'll find evidence of old subarachnoid hemorrhage where the patient bled and as a result of that there was scarring and obstruction of flow of CSF. The therapy for normal pressure hydrocephalus is uh, either conservative or shunting. 
First of all, when you start talking about normal pressure hydrocephalus, the typical classic presenting symptoms include uh, onset of uh, intellectual loss, loss of control of bladder and perhaps bowel, and abnormality of gait, this sort of shuffling gait where it seems like their feet are almost stuck to the floor. When you see the triad of intellectual loss, urinary incontinence, and gait abnormalities, that is suggestive of normal pressure hydrocephalus. There are specific st imaging studies that can be done to determine whether or not there is adequate flow of uh, fluid in the brain. Also, a monitor can be put inside the brain itself to determine whether there are periodic spikes or increases of pressure that are typical in normal pressure hydrocephalus. Even though it's called normal pressure hydrocephalus, it turns out that there are periods of time where the pressure actually goes up. And that's what causes the, the, uh, the obstruction of flow and the other types of injury that uh, occurs in these brains. If a person has this triad and then you monitor them and it turns out that you demonstrate that they have these pressure spikes that go up, then it is possible that shunting procedures may be beneficial for these individuals. What does a shunt look like? Well, in the next slide, we see a picture of a slunt, shunt. To the left, we see the reservoir, and that actually sits on top of your skull. The metal fitting at the top is connected to a tube that is buried underneath your scalp, down through your neck, on top of your chest wall, and empties into your abdominal cavity. Your abdominal cavity, by the way, is sterile. That's why you can empty this fluid into your abdominal cavity, not into your stomach or your intestines, but into your abdominal cavity. So this button sits on top of your skull, and if you ever feel around on top of a patient's head who's had a shunt, you can actually feel this button. And then that tube, that long tube that crosses your screen, that actually protrudes through the skull, through the dura, into the brain tissue, and into the ventricles. To the far right of your screen, you can see the sh part of the uh, shunt, the tube, that is actually placed inside the ventricles. And you can see that there are all these holes in the tube. That's where the fluid drains through, up and out of the tube, into the reservoir, where there is a one-way valve that then carries it down and empties into your abdominal cavity. This is a shunt that is in was inserted into a patient that had normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is the typical procedure that is performed. Why then would we not put shunts in everybody who has enlarged ventricles and intellectual loss? Well, first of all, even in people with normal pressure hydrocephalus, they don't always work. If the person has some antecedent, some pre-existing reason for why they have NPH, old infection, old hemorrhage, that sort of thing, then almost two-thirds of them get improvement if you put a shunt in. If, however, there's no clear reason why uh, they have these enlarged ventricles, less than half get improvement. If the person has dementia or if they are advanced in age, over 75, uh, then uh, the shunting procedure tends to not be as successful. On the other hand, in a younger patient with minimal dementia, and significant gait or bladder problems, the shunt may be very, very helpful. It requires a careful clinical assessment and then a thoughtful clinical decision as to whether or not to put a shunt in a patient with possible normal pressure hydrocephalus. The other side of this is that there are complications about sticking one of these things through the skull and into the brain tissue. First of all, even if everything goes great, the patient's going to be confused following the surgery. There's going to be post-op delirium. You can cause one of these blood clots, these subdural hematomas. You can cause bleeding onto the brain itself, referred to as a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can actually produce bleeding into the brain tissue called a parenchymal hematoma. And of course, you can get infected, and the shunt itself can malfunction. So there are many complications associated with any kind of invasive surgical procedure, such as putting a shunt in a patient. Consequently, we don't routinely shunt patients unless there are uh, clear, clean clinical indications that it might be normal pressure hydrocephalus, that there is evidence of increased pressure, and that the shunting might be beneficial. 
What conclusions then can we draw from uh, parts 9 and 10 about dementia other than Alzheimer's disease? First of all, if you want to distinguish Alzheimer's from all these other types of dementia, you have to do a careful clinical history. Then you have to do a careful physical examination. Remember these, those charts that we were showing you earlier where a, a presence of neurolog focal neurological uh, findings, uh, for instance, suggests something like vascular dementia. Presence of extrapyramidal findings suggests uh, diffuse Lewy body disease. Uh, this would be involved also with the neurological examination. Mental status examinations are essential to distinguish different types of dementia. If a person has uh, substantial behavioral problems that suggest frontal lobe abnormalities, and yet their uh, cognitive screening instruments, such as the mini mental, indicate that they have only mild impairment. So, for instance, if a patient won't get up out of bed, won't shower, won't do basic ADLs, and yet they're scoring 23 or 24 on their mini mental, that suggests to you that perhaps the patient might have frontotemporal dementia rather than Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the second thing to remember is that some dementias uh, may be genetically linked. For instance, frontotemporal dementia probably has at least some partial genetic linkages. Other types of dementia, such as diffuse Lewy body disease, have no known genetic linkages. Treatment varies according to diagnosis. In other words, with an alcoholic, what you want to do is make them sober, replace their vitamins, do all those sorts of good supportive care. On the other hand, that's not going to be particularly beneficial in a patient with frontal temporal dementia. Patients with diffuse Lewy body disease may benefit from cholinesterase inhibitors and they may benefit from anti-Parkinsonian drugs. Mixed dementias are common. So you may not have simply one dementia. You could have Alzheimer's plus vascular or Alzheimer's plus diffuse Lewy, or you may even have three separate clinical entities all in the same patient. That makes this whole business very complex. And finally, it's important to remember that the autopsy is the only confirmatory test to distinguish all of the different types of dementia that we have listed in parts 9 and 10 